So now let's continue with the discussion of 1547 2018 version. And we talked about some of the changes that were made since the 2003 version. This is a really a, a major effort. And it took a while to do this because they had to get uh, a bunch of different stakeholders synced together as far as utilities and, and vendors and consumer groups. Uh, so this was in the works for a long time before this finally got approved. But something you see in here, which is a little bit mind boggling, is this voltage ride through curve. And let me try to break this down a little bit, because as I mentioned before, if we have a grid disturbance, we don't want the DER necessarily to trip offline, because if it's a large percentage of our total generation, we, we can't afford that. And so there's what's called a voltage ride through requirement where inverters need to operate a certain way during either an outage or a voltage sag. So let me go ahead and get my pen turned on. So basically what you see in green between the 1.1 and 0.9 per unit is that if the voltage within, within this range, this is kind of normal operating range, this would actually be what we refer to as range B for residential customers. But for commercial operations, this is acceptable all the time. And so between 0 0.9 and 1.1, any sort of inverter interface is supposed to stay connected. What happens when we have a fault is the voltage is gonna sag. And you can see that up to having a 0.5 per unit drop in voltage, that means the voltage is dropping down to 0.5 of nominal, basically up to 20 seconds, this has to have what's referred to as a, a mandatory operation capability. So the unit has to stay connected. In fact, what the unit um, would also need to be able to do if it had the capability would be to inject reactive power to kind of help support the voltage in the process. And so there is a, a little bit of a, a, a dropout option that's in here. But basically what this says is, is if you drop below 0.9, as long as you're above 0.5 per unit, then that unit needs to hang in there. And note this time scale is a log scale right here. It's not a, it's not a linear scale. So that's kind of a long time for the unit to be hanging in, but just keep in mind that there's gonna be like recloser operations going on. And some of these faults take a long time to clear. And, and so this is what they came up with in the standards. If you drop below 0 0.9 and you're, and you're above 0 0.5, once you get beyond this 20 second, then you need to trip out. Another thing you see is that the voltage drops below 0 0.5 all the way down to zero. So this is, for all practical purposes, a disconnection from the grid. There's what they refer to as a momentary cessation capability. And so what this means is that the inverter is not injecting power into the grid, but it's kind of like in a standby mode, kind of floating online. So as soon as we connect back up again, it's ready to go. It doesn't have to go through a restart. And again, this is a log scale. So everything's not linear on the x-axis, but you can see that it's got to be able to hang in there as far as staying operational for up, up to a second. Usually by that time, most faults would have been cleared. And so there's a big difference in the two types of operations. You know, so say momentary cessation means it's kind of floating. It's, it's not injecting. It's not doing anything. It's just stay synchronized to the grid, ready to go back on as soon as the grid stabilizes. But the mandatory operation basically means this needs to still be injecting power if possible. And again, maybe even injecting some reactive power to support the voltage. There is an overvoltage range in here. And note what's required is you need to cease capability. Normally, if we're over voltage, just injecting uh, power is just going to make things worse, right? Uh, and so this would be a case where you want the unit not injecting anymore and ready to come back on. And I'm not sure this looks like it says like 13 seconds or so. And then when you're outside, either on top over here or over to the right or down here, 
then these are shall trip regions. And so this is a major modification because to have the logic and inverter to support this ride through capability um, takes quite a bit of effort. Um, the issue we're kind of running into with this is we don't know exactly how the inverter vendors implement this functionality. And so beyond this curve, we're not exactly sure what these units are actually doing. Everybody has a slightly different take on the logic that they, they put inside their inverter unit. There's a similar curve for frequency ride through. And frequency ride through, basically what this says is that if you're within this range of 58.8 to 61.2 Hertz, then that inverter should stay connected to the grid. It needs to be able to support grid operations. It's it's part, it's a could be a big part of the generation mix. If you get above a frequency 61.2, then you're supposed to stay in and operate. All right. So you're not just supposed to trip offline, but you're supposed to stay in and operate. Now there's some other functionality where you might back off on your generation. And then once you get above the 61 8. 61.8, then you have the option of riding through or tripping as long as you're within under a certain time range. And then it, as time goes to infinity, basically, then in both over frequency cases, I mean, you're eventually going to trip in here. But what you're supposed to be able to do, is you're supposed to be able to ride through um, certain types of grid over voltages. What's more common is to have an under frequency because if a large generator unit trips offline, then the, the frequency is gonna sag until the generation mix can be readjusted. And so you have a mandatory operation capability um, that, that goes all the way down to 57. Um, basically what it needs to do is it needs to hang in there uh, up to a certain time and then once you get below 57, then you kind of have the option of whether you're going to ride through or trip. Once you get, if you're in a large scale grid and you get all the way down to 57, you're in big trouble. I mean, a lot of these large scale synchronous generating units, which are powered by steam or gas turbines, uh, can't operate that low in frequency. So once you get that low, everything's going to fall apart. And you're probably going to be in a blackout mode anyway. But to, you know, to drop down, um, down to 58.8 Hertz is, you know, could happen. Um, it's not a, it's not an uncommon sort of an event, but get below 57, you're, you're basically on your way probably to a blackout situation anyway. So basically the idea would, again, would be that if there's a system frequency variation, normally what happens when you trip a unit, frequency drops down, and then there's like a recovery and it maybe kind of oscillates a little bit. You basically want to make sure that you got as much generation as you can hanging in there to kind of help support the frequency. Okay. And then you've got some flexibility of adjusting these set points within the unit. That's, these are actually to some extent all programmable as far as these cutoffs. Another thing you see in the 2018 compliant devices is you, you have a voltage reactive power characteristic. And you can see that you have voltage on the X axis that if you go up too high in voltage or too low in voltage, then you're gonna have a reactive power injection or absorption. So remember we talked about capacitors. We, we put a capacitor in there for boosting voltage. And so if you have, a unit that injects far is what's going to happen that's going to boost the voltage. So you see in this case, if the voltage gets below a dead man set point, then what you basically do is you kind of have this thing act like a variable capacitor in a way, and you start to inject reactive power up to some type of a limit. And then on the other end, if the voltage goes up too high, then you actually start to inject negative reactive power. You can think about this device as absorbing reactive power. So the passive element that absorbs reactive power is an inductor. And so it's almost like we're putting the inductor in there and we're basically trying to drop the voltage down. Now, why would you want this? Well, 
real power injection, what it does is it boosts the voltage up. If you have these devices also absorb reactive power, it tends to kind of help drag the voltage back down again. And you can actually adjust these devices where the voltage boost caused by real power is offset by reactive power flow. One problem you run into with the reactive power flow though, is if you don't do it correctly, it could actually interact improperly with the utility voltage regulation. So this all has to be kind of coordinated with the utility. Each DER operator can't come up with these set points on their own. And when they talk about, they have in the standard what's called a category B control. And then basically what you need to have is you need to have a K bar injection, which is 44% of the nameplate. And so what this means, if you have like a, a thousand kVA unit, then you need to be able to um, absorb or inject 440 uh, kVAR. One thing about inverters is they're current limited. And so you could use all the current capability in delivering real power, but then if you need to inject reactive power, that's going to take away from the amount of real power you can deliver. And so what this is basically saying is you would need to kind of overbuild these inverters just a little bit to have enough headroom where if you were going to stay at the same real power output, you'd have some flexibility for reactive power injection absorption. But all these set points, all these set points can all be changed. And so that's really the challenge is trying to figure out how to adjust these set points. And these units, the set points can be adjusted by communications interface. The utility might actually dynamically control these set points on some of the larger inverters. The other thing that's in the 2018 version of 1547 is what's called frequency droop. This is kind of similar to voltage in a way, but basically what this means is that if you're going to go up like too high in frequency, then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to cut back on the um, amount of real power you're actually injecting into the unit. And so uh, what's what this is kind of showing here is, is, is showing this kind of like this frequency droop kind of a characteristic right here. And then basically, um, what you're, you're kind of doing in this case is you're just kind of backing off. So if there's an event that's causing an over frequency, um, you're basically trying to not inject as much P. So really what you're, you'd be doing in this case is you'd actually be injecting below what's called the, the maximum peak power tracking point. Um, Operators obviously don't like to do this because they get their revenue from pushing power into the grid, but it, if there's a, a certain type of event, this is for a relatively short period of time, it could actually make the grid more stable if oh, during over frequency events, these, these units could actually drop back through the use of this sort of a droop characteristic right here. So this would be a, like an automatic curtailment. Now, a long time ago, um, we had flicker requirements on voltage. And where this kind of came from is when we had incandescent light bulbs. So an incandescent light bulb is this old style light bulb that has a filament in it. And depending on the voltage you have across that, that this light would shine more or less bright. If you had a voltage variation, what would happen is that the light intensity would go up and down. And what they found out was that for humans and also animals, that if you had too much of this flicker, uh, it would can cause, ir you know, you'd notice it and then up to a certain point, it would even cause irritability. And so some of these farming operations, you know, they found out like if you had like a large chicken coop, whatever, and then the lights were flickering, that the, it kind of, um, cause a lot of psychological damage like to the to the chickens in the coop the go. So anyway, what they came up with, they came up with these flicker standards. So basically you couldn't have, you know, this deviation in light intensity. So this is basically what this standard is based on. Now, since then, we've kind of, we're not really using these incandescent light bulbs as much as we used to, but there's other sort of devices that are sensitive to this voltage variation as well. 
And so there's a standard, as I mentioned before, this IEC standard that came up with this algorithm that basically came up with an index um, through the use of kind of a complicated signal processing algorithm where they have this uh, term um, called PST and, and PLT. ST stands for short term and PLT stands for long term. And so one would be, you know, kind of corresponding to the your your threshold of a human or an animal being able to withstand the the deviation in light intensity. So they they came up with some flicker limits based on these numbers PST and PLT, uh, where PST the limit's 0.35 and PLT the limit's 0.25. Basically, PLT is kind of a um, based on taking the PST terms um, and running them through this sample calculation right here. Unfortunately, I can't give you a very simple mathematical formula for doing this calculation on your own. I could say it's an extremely complicated type of um, computation, um, but they do have this built into various types of meters. And so you don't would really never do this calculation manually, but you would get some sort of a power quality meter that had this capability of doing this flicker calculation. There's a number of other sort of indices you can calculate where you're looking at voltage deviation. Uh, one device which is kind of popular with a lot of utilities is this Schweitzer Engineering Lab 735. This is a high-end power quality meter. Um, kind of looks a little bit like a relay, but actually it's a meter. And not only does this measure this voltage deviation, this flicker, but it also measures um, other sort of quantities as well. You can, you can look at transits, um, you can look at harmonics, um, you, can, you can look at a variety of different terms when you have voltage sags or voltage increases, voltage interruptions due to faults. It could capture all that information for you. So it's it's really um, it's being used quite a bit on circuits that have PV or other DER to sort of help track what's going on in these circuits. So again, the where this is kind of pertinent to PV is basically what PV looks like is it kind of looks like a current injection, and what you get as a result of this current injection is you get a voltage drop. However, a lot of DER sources are intermittent. And so maybe what's going to happen, you get some cloud cover. And what happens is the PV output oscillates. And what that does is causes a change in the current injection, which is going to cause oscillation in the voltage change. And so this is kind of the flicker. Um, not only do you get this with PV, but you also get this with wind to a certain extent as well. So anyway, this is one thing we take a look at as we, we take a look at um, these flicker numbers when we're looking at the impact of, of PV and deciding whether you know, we can uh, afford to add an installation or not to a distribution feeder. Another term that's kind of come up recently, and this is kind of superseding the flicker a little bit, because flicker is, is something that happens somewhat continuously all the time, right? This is due to wind gusts, or this is due to cloud cover. But um, another ter uh, term that gets used to characterize voltage deviation is what's called rapid voltage change. And so these are really more discrete events. Um, these are more changes in the RMS voltage between two different steady state conditions. And in the uh, 1547 standard, what they say is when you have a point of common coupling at medium voltage, that this DER should not cause a step or a ramp change in RMS voltage exceeding 3% of nominal and exceeding 3% per second averaged over one second. All right, so basically what this means if we're doing a study, we'd be looking at an instance where PV could cause more than a 3% change in voltage. And this could maybe be due to like PV, you know, turning on and off rapidly or possibly the PV output due to cloud cover going from 100% down to say like 30% and then back up again, right? There's a slightly different uh, allowance when you're talking about low voltage connections. And what this is applying to 
is it's when you're energizing transformers, when you're doing capacitor switching, any sort of abrupt output operations caused by DER misoperation, these are all the things that um, this is associated with. Um, but it's not supposed to apply to very infrequent events. And so if you're gonna have like um, PV, you know, that for some other reason has to be taken offline for maintenance, let's say, you know, that, that change in voltage wouldn't count against you. But if you're talking about say like variations caused by cloud cover for PV, yeah, that's something you definitely have to look out for. And so we used to call everything flicker, but but nowadays we we call we we kind of analyze a lot of this in terms of this RVC standard, um, this rapid voltage change standard. So three percent is is kind of like your strictest criteria. Um, if this is not as frequent, you can maybe get by with some larger percent changes, but typically if you were doing a study, you're probably going to look at something between 2.5 and 3%. And each utility has slightly different takes on this as far as what they're going to use. But you know, between 2.5 and 3% is what a lot of them look at in terms of the voltage variability um, that's due to, you know, say, say things like flicker for a PV system installation. Now the 1547 standard talks about standardizing certain communication protocols, but they pretty much stick with a lot of the standard utility protocols. This is something we cover in 586, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, studying, uh, talking about this here, but just be aware that they support DNP3, they support a version of Modbus, and there's actually a special mapping um, that's designed for uh, DER devices especially for PV. And so SunSpec, which is a trade organization, you know, has come up with some standardized mappings as far as the um, points, you know, that you ought to be taking in the location of those points and the names of those points. So it, we're, we won't dwell on this here, but just know that there's certain sort of standards. There's a new standard that's come out and it's, it's starting to be adopted in California called 2030.5. This is more of a, um, server client server based standard you use http which is exactly what you use when you're using a web browser and it and it's basically assumes that the the pv inverter has an embedded um web server in it maybe this is a separate box that has this um and and so anyway they're kind of moving toward more client server architectures for interfacing to pv devices I, I talked before this, there's various state standards and, and a really good standard to take a look at is California Rule 21. This has been around for a long time. This is what the investor-owned utilities in California have to adhere to. So this be Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric. But it talks about, you know, what kind of data that has to be supplied for an interconnection application. You know, it talks about fast track, you know, what size systems could be fast tracked versus what systems you need a detailed study for. It, it talks a lot about some of the new smart inverter functionalities according to the 2018-1547 standard. And just as an example where you can find this, this is where PG&E keeps their copy, but then all the three IOUs have to file this. And so this is, been kind of developed over a long period of time, but this is this is really a kind of a good state of art reference and probably where a lot of other IOUs, investor owned utility in the United States are headed for um, as, as far as the way they interconnect DER. Uh, as far as the local company here, um, local to North Carolina State University, that would be Duke Energy, as I mentioned before. The specific entity is sometimes referred to as Duke Energy Progress, which is the old Progress Energy that had service territory in the eastern part of the state, and part of South Carolina. And the interconnection policies, um, I'm, I'm showing the North Carolina Utility Commission numbers. Everything's kind of classified by dockets, and these are the reference numbers for the, the docket. 
Um, as far as fast track screening, I'm not sure if this is totally up to date, but basically what you see is that if, if you're on a circuit between five and 15 kV, that there's fast track opportunity if you're less than a megawatt. Um, and this is regardless of location. Now, if you're gonna be closer to the substation, it says 2.5 electrical miles, this could actually go up to two megawatts. The reasoning being that if you're like two miles from a substation, that's like the backbone, that's probably the larger conductor size. So it's gonna be easier to interconnect. Whereas if you're farther away, there's more things to look at. And then you'll note that when you get up to the, lar the higher voltage levels, that this goes to two megawatts you know, as far as um, being able to fast track some of these um, installations. And so you'd really like to be eligible for a fast track because if you're not fast track, then a detailed engineering study gets done and this usually takes a long time to complete. And so this adds a lot of delay to the process if, you're, if your interconnection request needs to go through a detailed interconnect study. But all this information, you can start to find it up at this, this website. What's kind of interesting is the North Carolina Utility Commission, which um, obviously has jurisdiction for investor-owned utilities in North Carolina, um, all their proceedings and all their hearings are for the most part public. And so what's kind of interesting is you know, they're, they're, they have all these cases they're reviewing as far as requests for putting really large scale PV units on the grid. Um, you can see here, there's a, a presentation by Duke Energy on the 1547 standard. There's other developers that are trying to um, get large scale systems interconnected in the grid. And you could actually now, since they've moved a lot of stuff over to WebEx, you can actually get on here and log in and take a look at some of this. And so anyway, this is the YouTube channel. If you, if you ever want to do this, I, didn't, I guess I didn't give the link here, but if you do a search, North Carolina Utilities Commission, you could actually um, watch recordings of some of these where you could actually sit in on the WebEx. And so there's a lot of stuff you could actually learn about large scale um, DER interconnection from this. And as I mentioned before, then some states are publishing maps and I'm not gonna get into this right here. So let me let me stop here and then I'm gonna, when I come back, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the 1547.7. Um,